the loss of their assault company had its pros and cons. The Russians overestimated our strength along this sector, revised their plan and regrouped. This gave us time to evacuate the field hospital which the Soviets considered to be of such vital military importance. On the debit side, however, they did not transfer their strong point elsewhere as hoped, but replaced the lost company with a much stronger contingent, and with a stiffening of snipers exacted bloody revenge for the massacre. We had dug in temporarily to hold them at bay as ordered and received a sprinkling of reinforcements, but were so inadequately armed that no chance existed of overcoming the attack when it came the second time. With exceptional precision, the snipers concentrated on senior NCOs and officers. Platoon Sergeant Willie Hone stood up briefly to pass a hand signal to three stragglers when a conventional rifle bullet passed through his skull. His injury was so awful that an explosive bullet would have been kinder. I gave covering fire while four stout Jaeger carried him away. He survived, but never recovered his sight, one of the many hundreds of thousands of blind or mutilated veterans who faced an uncertain future in the ruins of post-war Germany. Rapidly interchanging my positions after each shot, I managed to score a few kills with my semi-automatic. When the assault came, fate smiled upon me kindly once more, and with the rearguard I managed to reach safety with seconds to spare. A few days later I was summoned by the adjutant at a regimental staff to attend battalion headquarter. Herr Obergefreiter, he beamed in greeting, you seem to be in the thick of it, don't you? First of all, I have pride in awarding you the Iron Cross First Class for your brave exploit in the framework of the regiment's recent tactical mission and the evacuation of the field hospital. In confidence, what you did has attracted attention at the very highest divisional level. There is something else in the pipeline. Be prepared for a surprise. He handed me an embellished scroll and a presentation case containing the order. I fastened the decoration at once to my left breast pocket, tossed the case into the mud upon leaving battalion headquarter, and mailed the certificate to my parents. The highest award for bravery in the Wehrmacht was the German Cross in Gold, awarded to a serving soldier regardless of his rank. The commanding general, Army Group Center, General Field Marshal Schoerner, was attempting, together with a regime of rigid discipline, to raise the troops' will to fight through the unorthodox award of decorations. Accordingly, I was recommended for the Knight's Cross, normally awarded only to officers and NCOs for personal bravery and outstanding contributions of strategic importance. The Knight's Cross was one of the highest decorations of the Wehrmacht, and its award was usually accompanied by a lavish celebration and a spot of home leave immediately after. Due to the collapse of the infrastructure, the value placed on the ceremony had tended to diminish of late, well expressed in a droll mess room cartoon, Kindly bring your cutlery when attending for medal awards, and the awards of the Knight's Cross to Josef Roth and myself were similarly low-key. On Hitler's birthday, 20 April 1945, Josef and I were ordered to cause headquarter. An amphibious Kubelwagen was sent to fetch us and we alighted at Mönnehofen, a small village. Corps' headquarter was established in a kind of farmhouse, the activity resembling a beehive. Dispatch riders and vehicles drew in and left, orders were barked, an abundance of staff officers were preoccupied with the impending evacuation. Our shabby uniforms and pinched, hardened faces must have made a very poor impression. A soldier brought us an opened can of herrings in tomato sauce, a chunk of bread and a pot of something tasty but indescribable. At least we had a full stomach while waiting, though and that was something of a rarity in those days of impending disaster. The hours went by. We had fallen asleep against a barn wall when a voice inquired loudly from within the headquarter, Where are the gentlemen for the Knight's Cross? An NCO emerged and commented in a voice heavy with sarcasm, Are you the mountain troops to be knighted? Well, kindly step this way. Herr Oberst has the sword ready for the ceremony. We struggled to our feet and were led into a hallway where a colonel of the general staff, his breeches bearing the red trouser stripe, approached carrying a file of papers. A soldier carrying a camera followed him. Joseph and I, sniper rifles slung at the shoulder, came to attention. 
Stand easy, gentlemen, the Oberst said jovially. Please excuse the makeshift nature of this celebration, but I beg your understanding under the current circumstances. The Herr Field Marshal was hoping to be present to congratulate you personally, but unfortunately there was no time. I will therefore proceed in his name. At that he opened the file and read out, Army Group Centre Headquarter, 20 April 1944. To Obergefreiter Josef Allerberger, I am greatly honoured to award you, on the Führer's instruction on the occasion of 20 April 1945, the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross and a gift hamper. From the reports of your commander, I understand that you have provided repeated examples of outstanding military conduct and bravery. I wish you much luck and a safe homecoming. Heil Hitler. General Field Marshal Schoener. The same text was read out in respect of Josef Roth, after which the colonel gestured to a soldier to approach with a folded tent cloth bearing two iron crosses, second class converted to knight's crosses. The officer took up the first cross and ribbon, approached me, asked me if I had washed my neck. When I responded with a look of puzzlement, he whispered, Just my little joke, and placed the decoration over my head to hang around my neck. After repeating the ceremony for Josef Roth, he said quietly, I am really proud to have soldiers like you in the Corps. My warmest congratulations and personal acknowledgement. I hope you survive in good health and return to the bosom of your families and your civilian life. To camera flashes, he shook my hand and explained, Once the general situation has stabilised, you will receive the proper Knight's Cross medal with a scroll signed by the Führer. In the meantime, I pass you this letter from the Field Marshal. As a token of his personal esteem, he encloses autographed photographs of himself and your divisional commander, General Klatt. A bitter undertone as he spoke was not lost on us. He knew we were only a fortnight or so away from capitulation. With a gesture of the hand, he had our presentation hampers brought in. Two wooden artillery chests filled with all manner of delicacies, and with a cheerful, best of luck, Maina Heron. The colonel left. A photographer asked me if I would pose briefly for the international press, and steered me into the required position. A flashbulb flared twice, and the sitting was over. Before he went, I asked if he would send a print of each negative to my parents. He promised to do so, and kept his word. The ceremony concluded, my driver arrived for the chests and packed them aboard the Kubel wagon for the return journey. The hamper contents I shared out among comrades that same evening. From Corps Headquarter Feld Post I mailed the award documents home, but they never arrived, although the autographed photos of Schoener and Klatt mailed separately did make it. Our division had its back to the Reich border. By now the logistics, military communications and OKH command structure were in total disarray. In the effort to stave off defeat, Hitler Youth, men of pensionable age and untrained units, were thrown into the fray, but had no hope of making an impression against an enemy present in overwhelming numbers on many fronts. With the help of field police and SS troops, Flying courts and seizure squads had been set up whose purpose was to uphold military discipline and fighting spirit. In tribunal hearings, lasting only a few minutes, soldiers arrested for being absent from their units without valid papers were condemned as deserters and executed immediately. The defence that in the confusion of the front military bureaucracy had collapsed was not acceptable. Many foreign volunteers and camp followers from the battle zones who had attached to individual units and followed their fortunes in defeat also met a violent and unjust end, and a large number were executed after trial by a flying court on alleged suspicion of subversion or collaboration with partisans. Although death was part of the daily routine for me, a case of the latter kind affected me greatly, coinciding with my arrival in the Ukraine in 1943. A young woman had attached herself to GJR 144. Olga was 22 and became the paramour of an administrative officer. Apart from sharing his bed, she worked for the regimental staff as an interpreter. She was an uncomplicated, lusty blonde whose main aim was survival. She looked forward to the end of the war 
and a chance to settle somewhere in the West. The identity of the person who denounced Olga as a partisan spy was never made known, although we had our private suspicions. I was present at her trial, which lasted ten minutes. The attempt by several NCOs and men to speak as witnesses on her behalf was refused, with veiled references to their personal safety being in jeopardy if they persisted with their applications. The administrative officer did nothing to help his former lover. He was probably glad to be rid of her, for he was a married man, and he would have been ruined if knowledge of the affair had reached home. After sentence, Olga was led out by several men in civilian clothing and made to stand on the flap of a lorry positioned below a tree. A length of telephone cable fashioned into a noose at one end was hung around her neck, the slack slung over a stout branch and secured. An SS man slapped the roof of the cab, the lorry moved forward, and Olga was left dangling. Death claimed her within a few minutes. The SS seemed to enjoy the theatre, but most Jager turned away in disgust. My regiment moved up to Mährisch Ostrau. The Russians were at Brünn, although some of their troops were already in Berlin. The German army leaderless fought on in isolated groups. In the east, endless streams of refugees headed westward, blocking the highways. 3rd GD was one such group determined to resist and fight to the last. The end was close. It was an anachronism of the German death gasps that new weapons and equipment should suddenly arrive at the front. The battalion had mobilised for yet another relief attempt. I could hardly believe my eyes when a 40-strong Waffen-SS sniper company marched up. Over their uniforms they wore camouflage smocks with deep hoods, their helmets were fitted with a camouflaged cloth cover, and a special veil could be fitted to mask the face. Green webbing at the waist carried a Mauser K98K bayonet scabbard and a practical tool pack. Most had self-loading 43 rifles with four-power scope, although two carried the new fully automatic Sturmgewehr 44 with scope. The squad consisted of 16-year-old boys recruited only weeks previously. A two-week sniper course had transformed them into the fighting elite of the Wehrmacht, as they informed me. They were now fully prepared and determined to meet the enemy head-on, convinced of their invincibility. Their leader was a Sturmführer, senior lieutenant in his early twenties. To judge by his cold-blooded attitude, the survival of these boys came pretty low on his list of priorities. As I watched them march off to disappear without trace in the Russian fire dance, I could only think poor swine, they looked to me like fodder for the sawmill. The division retreated to Olmutz in central Czechoslovakia. We were still fighting on 8 May 1945, when to our surprise the Russians ceased fire and returned to their positions. Aircraft dropped leaflets advising of the German capitulation and demanding that all Wehrmacht units lay down their arms and surrender. The divisional commander, General Klatt, was not prepared to do this because he feared for his men and had no guarantee what would become of them as captives. On the evening of the following day, a radio broadcast was made conveying the last order of the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, or OKW, the High Command of the Wehrmacht. On the southeast and east fronts, all principal unit staffs as far back as Dresden have been ordered to cease fire. The Czech insurrection over nearly all Bohemia and Moravia may hinder compliance with the terms of the capitulation and end communications in the region. The High Command has so far received no reports as to Army Groups Law, Rendulik and Schirner. The full text of the message was read to our battalion by an officer. All knew now that they were confronted by an uncertain and possibly alarming future. General Klatt released all men of the division from their oath of allegiance so as to give each the vague possibility of reaching home by their own efforts rather than surrender. Wending one's way home was something easier said than done, for large numbers of Russian units had infiltrated to our rear through the great gaps in the front line and incited the Czech population to a bloodlust. Most of our men were in favour of attempting to reach the American forces on the Moldau River by obtaining lorry transport, even though the roads were blocked by countless refugees. This seemed to me to offer a poor prospect of escaping Russian captivity. I decided to make for Austria on foot and in company with a friend, Peter Gollop. 
It would mean covering 250 kilometres through enemy territory, but I had sufficient experience to make my way cross-country unseen with no better aid than a compass. At all times the two of us would have to bear in mind the possibility of capture by Russian or Czech partisan forces, which might easily mean a very unpleasant death. To reduce this risk as much as possible we had to avoid any confrontation, and I elected to discard my sniper rifle in favour of a pistol and MP40. To have carried a rifle with scope was suicidal. The fate meted out to persons identified as snipers was well known. The weapon was only a piece of equipment, a means to an end, but all the same it was with a heavy heart that I decided it had to go. I located an SP goon with a crowd of infantrymen aboard and begged a lift. I told the driver to wait an instant while I laid my rifle under the tracks. The vehicle moved forward and spewed out Aston a small heap of crushed junk. With very few exceptions, all German snipers destroyed their weapons at the war's end or before being taken captive, and for that reason specimens of sniper rifles as war relics are very rare. A hand slapped my shoulder, making me start. I turned and looked into the eyes of the red-bearded Viking sergeant. Don't take it so tragically, he counselled me. Without it, your chances of reaching home safely are much improved. Enjoy the peace, if you make it. Then he turned and disappeared into the undergrowth like a phantom. Very few German units were prepared to surrender to the Soviets. Since most preferred to fight their way through to the west, the Soviets resumed the offensive on 10th May 1945 with massive tank and aerial attacks against the refugee columns, suspecting that many German soldiers would have inveigled themselves into the civilian ranks. Any small party of men was picked out and gunned by low-flying fighter aircraft. Peter Gollop and I resolved to move only by night, hiding up and sleeping by day. On the second night in the Sudetenland, we came upon an isolated farmhouse. It was occupied, for a flickering interior illumination could be seen through the windows. We were very hungry and cherished hopes that we might be able to beg food from these peasants of German stock. We approached warily and tapped on a window pane. The curtain was pushed aside and a man's face appeared. He was holding a lighted candle and looked about fifty. Peering out, he saw us, unlatched the window and asked in very broken German what we wanted. I realised at once that he was a Czech and I stepped back instinctively into the shadows. At that time we knew nothing of the persecution and brutal deportation of the Sudeten Germans by the Czech population. My inexperienced comrade threw caution to the wind and spoke up, offering a pair of new shoes in exchange for a meal. My distrust grew when I glimpsed on the wall of the room, a frame bearing a religious text in German, and below it a German calendar for the year 1945. The Czech agreed to provide bread for the shoes, and whispered suddenly, Russian soldier upstairs, wait, I will be back in few minutes, and with that he withdrew. Now I was even more uneasy. What was a Czech doing in a German house? Why was he sharing the house with a Russian soldier? I whispered to Peter. This stinks, forget the shoes and let's get out of here, and pulled him away from the window by the sleeve of his uniform tunic. I don't think so, he responded, and jerked his cuff free. Heading for the small wood from which we had approached the house, I called back insistently, Quick! Get away from here, you idiot, before they nab you. My determination unsettled him, and, casting a final glance at the window, turned with some reluctance to join me. I was thirty metres away from the house, and in darkness, Peter about ten metres behind when the check reappeared at the window and opened fire with an MP40. This galvanised Peter into action, and he sprinted towards me. At the first shot I had thrown myself to the ground and worked my own MP40 into position. Seconds later, Peter was hit and fell face forward. Now I returned fire. Glass shattered and the wooden window frame splintered. I was not sure that I had hit the check, but at any rate he disappeared from sight and did not shoot again. Keeping low, I reached Peter and dragged him by the collar as fast as I could into the wood since I thought it likely that an armed party would soon emerge from the house. It remained as quiet as the grave, however. 
Once behind the cover of trees and vegetation, I laid him flat on his stomach and examined his wounds. He was still alive, but bleeding badly. I knew he would never survive these injuries, and he died a few minutes later. I had been watching the farmhouse all the while from the corner of my eye. It was all quiet, but I remained suspicious. Orienting myself by the pole star and my compass, I set off at a trot. Alone, I had to be doubly watchful. To lure German soldiers from their hiding places, Czech partisans wore German uniforms. I knew about this ruse and hid myself from people in German uniform unless I was certain that they were bona fide. At dawn, on the second day following the farmhouse shooting, I had heard muffled voices speaking in German. I stalked the group with great caution, and while still concealed in undergrowth, identified them as being from my regiment's artillery battalion. In high tension at the precariousness of my situation, I called out a warning, rose from cover and was about to introduce myself when one of the gunners exclaimed, That is Joseph Allerberger, the sniper with many kills, who has the gold sniper badge and the knight's cross. It was a twelve-strong group, led by Oberfeldwebel Wehrmeier, a regimental warrant officer. As soon as my name was mentioned, a heated discussion developed as to whether I should be allowed to join. The problem was that snipers had recently been made into hot properties by German propaganda, and their faces, including mine, had been splashed all over the newspapers. It was therefore very probable that partisans and Russians alike knew my name and features by heart and would be looking for me specifically among captives they took. Understandably, some of the group feared reprisals for themselves should their little band be captured and Josef Alaberga be found to have been travelling with it. This made me feel very uneasy and I had just decided to continue alone when Wehrmeyer ended all discussion by offering me a place in their ranks provided I occupied the unfavoured rearguard position on the march. Thus I spent the next four days well behind the group, keeping to cover. The gunners were light-headed and confident at their chances of success. Each day they spent a little longer marching in daylight. On the fourth day they came across a dead Czech. He had been stabbed recently, for the blood on his clothing had not yet dried. In anxiety, the group stood around the body discussing what best to do about it. Suddenly the corpse opened its eyes, sat up with a crazed look, spat blood, raised its MP40 and pulled the trigger. The artillerists sprinted for cover and threw themselves to the ground. The entire magazine of bullets whistled harmlessly over their heads, and a few seconds later the check fell backwards and finally expired. The whole episode was bad news, for it was unlikely that this partisan was an independent. Immediately after the incident, three German infantrymen stepped into the roadway about 50 metres ahead of the group shouting, Don't shoot! We are Jaeger from Regiment 144, 3rd Gebirgs Division. From afar, I recognised them as members of the regimental staff, the photographer, the sketch artist and an admin clerk called Schmidt known as Schmittel for short, on account of his small stature. At my suggestion they were happy to fall in with me. As non-combatants they felt protected and somewhat safer. I felt the urge to distance myself from the gunners. Their resentment of my presence was only too obvious. The photographer and Schmittel each had a compass, and so I traded mine for half a tin of meat. Because of the strange incident of the dead Czech, both groups were anxious to move on as quickly as possible. Group photos were taken, and then we parted. The four of us penetrated deep into the woods, searching for a safe hiding place to spend the rest of the daylight. The artillerists had felt confident that it was safe to continue along the road by day. But that was their undoing, for barely half an hour had passed before we heard several furious bursts of MG fire from quite close by. I took a compass bearing and went off to reconnoitre, keeping to dense bush. I had walked about a kilometre when I came to an open field where I saw the artillerists engaged in a violent firefight with a much larger group of Czech irregulars. Seven Jager were strewn dead on the terrain. The whole situation looked very unfavourable for the five survivors, and I decided that even if we four joined in, we would merely be sacrificing our lives uselessly. Back at the hiding place I quickly briefed the others, 
By mutual agreement, we destroyed our traces, broke camp, and set off to find some other safe spot instead. For days on end, we walked by night and hid up by day, giving houses and villages a wide berth and avoiding open highways and footpaths. The artist had a nasty hand wound, received during a skirmish with Czech partisans. It had not been properly treated and was badly inflamed. The man had a constant light fever and the wound, which had begun to stink, looked gangrenous. Whenever we came upon clear water, we would clean it, wash the bandages and reapply them. We had nothing left to eat and to keep us going, chewed birch leaves and grass and drank water sweetened with saccharine from Schmittel's small supply. Day after day we plodded by night to the northwest, where lay the defeated Reich. We were fourteen days on the march. At dawn one morning we had just found a suitable hiding place on the banks of a clear stream, and were tending the artist's wound when the sound of several lorries became audible. I left the others and went off to scout. After about fifteen hundred metres I found myself at a roadside. Four Mercedes lorries with SS markings were climbing a steep gradient in first gear. In the interiors I could make out tightly packed unarmed German infantrymen. I ducked instinctively into the undergrowth, for I was very wary of SS units and the rough justice they dealt out. The war had been over for weeks, of course, but we were still in an apparently German-controlled sector, and the greatest caution was necessary for as far as I knew it looked like the SS had not accepted the cessation of hostilities. Back at camp we calculated that we must be close to Reich territory. I reckoned that if we made 15 kilometres per night, 20 more days should see us home. We had resumed our march for about an hour when we came across a farmhouse. A middle-aged lady was in the open arranging some garden implements. The photographer volunteered to address the lady on our behalf while we hid in the tall grass. Seconds later, he beckoned us forward. We've done it, we're almost home, he beamed. This place is twenty kilometres into Austria. The Americans have already been and gone, and Ivan is miles away. The farm lady greeted us warmly and invited us into the house to share her meagre supply of food and to tend the artist's wound. She served us homegrown vegetables and potatoes, yogurt and apple juice. After months of deprivation, it tasted like the nectar of the gods, and we ate fit to burst. Next day, we paid for our gluttony with diarrhoea. Like hundreds of thousands of mothers, she had lost her sons in the war. As she gave us their civilian clothes in exchange for our uniforms, tears rolled down her cheeks. We accepted her kindness in silence. Freshly showered, we lay in bed for the first time in months and slept deeply, stomachs filled and contented. After breakfasting, we thanked the woman warmly and took our leave. Showing us the road to take, she waved until we were out of sight. The brief sojourn had strengthened our resolve. Overconfident, we walked in daylight upon the open road after burying our weapons at the edge of a field, hoping for fair treatment from the Americans should we be captured. At midday we reached the hamlet which the farm lady had described. Chatting, we turned into the main street and froze in horror. Fifty metres ahead of us was a group of American soldiers and a large number of German prisoners. Wavering between flight and surrender, one of the G.I.s made our minds up for us. Unslinging his Garand self-loading sniper rifle, he called out, Hands up, guys, don't move. War is over, Krauts. Your bastard Hitler is dead. Your Scheißfuhrer can't help you any more. Come here, keep your hands up, move slowly. Although my knowledge of English was very basic, I realised it was best to do as he said. The American sniper would have shot us all dead within seconds if we had tried to run for it. Our war was now over officially. Raising our hands, we approached the G.I.s slowly and received a superficial pat-down for weapons. I looked at the sniper rifle with interest. Technically, it looked very solid and robust, but I was surprised that the scope was mounted so close to the line of sight. A private pushed us among the other German prisoners. Sit down there, he said with a cynical smile, and look forward to better times. I think you're really going to love your long holiday in Russia. The word Russia ripped through me like a bullet. The artist whispered, Shit, 
They're going to hand us over to Ivan. We've got to get out of here, or we've had it. At that moment, a US Army jeep leading two Mercedes lorries with SS markings and SS drivers pulled up alongside the prisoners, and those nearest had to climb aboard. As soon as the lorries were packed tight, they drove off smartly. Have a nice trip, you glorious Aryan heroes, the GI called out. Now I knew the significance of the SS lorries crammed with Germans, which I had seen two days previously. They were deliveries to the Russians as fodder for the gulags and lead mines. Our American guards were not very watchful since the prisoners were exhausted and in no mood for escaping. The prisoners trusted the Americans, and most did not believe that the US Army could play such a filthy trick on them. The four of us were sitting on a waist-high wall, behind which was a bushy slope, a narrow valley bottom and then dense woodland, ideal cover for fugitives. With cautious whispers, we agreed that we had to disappear as soon as possible before the next transports arrived. Three of us were bent on escape without any doubts, but Schmittel hesitated because he did not believe we would be handed over to the Russians. We agreed the order of disappearance, artist, photographer, Schmittel, and then me. The adrenaline was flowing in my veins, my heart beating furiously. We were risking our lives to survive. As three more transports drove into view, the first two men dropped over the wall unseen. When I told Schmittel to jump, he refused. I've had enough of it, he said, and I'm not risking my arse any more. Look, these guys are Americans. They simply wouldn't hand us over to Ivan. The lorries were coming closer. Time was short. Timing was everything, and the last moment had arrived. I'll wait for you thirty minutes at the edge of the wood, I hissed, then rolled over the wall as the lorries squealed to a stop. Minutes later I joined the other two beyond the valley and told them what had transpired. Schmittel never came. I saw him six years later, after he was released to the Federal Republic from the lead mines at Karaganda. He was by then a sick and broken man. We three musketeers headed for Linz, moving by day, but always alert to the possibility of American patrols. We had avoided a village and taken a footpath lined with thick vegetation on both sides when we were surprised by the cry of many voices. Fear ran through my bones as I saw a number of skeletal forms in striped suits running towards us, obviously intending to attack. They appeared pitifully emaciated and weak, and although easily outnumbering us, it was child's play to fight them off with blows to the face and body. We had nothing worth stealing, and realising this, they disengaged as rapidly as they had attacked. Breathlessly, we stared at one another in astonishment, and eventually concluded that they must have been homeless men who had escaped from a mental institution. Months later, when we learnt that they were former inmates of a concentration camp who had escaped and were marauding through the district, I felt justified in having defended myself, but the affair left a bad taste in the mouth. Next day, we reached Linz. This was where Hitler had spent his late childhood. The city seemed full of refugees. At the city gates, we succeeded in finding a place aboard an Opel Blitz lorry, but after a few kilometres the journey ended at an American roadblock. Everybody had to get out and line up at the roadside. We were searched thoroughly, and robbed of anything valuable or which might serve as a souvenir. On the instructions of an embittered NCO, we had to remove our shirts and submit to an examination of the right armpit for the SS tattoo. Having survived that, we sat and waited. All day long, men of military age were held, searched, and then made to join our ranks. Towards evening, we were about 100 strong and loaded aboard lorries for Lintz railway station, where a train composed of a locomotive and countless cattle trucks drew in. Its destination was a holding camp at Mauerkirchen. Tens of thousands of former Wehrmacht troops were forced to camp here in the open. It might have been deliberate, but the logistical problem had clearly defeated the Americans. Two days later, they began to release the walking wounded. The artist's gangrenous hand needed proper medical treatment, and since the artist, the photographer and I, all supposedly came from the same village, the artist was released into our custody as his carers. A discharge paper guaranteed us passage. 
we were taken to Linz by lorry and unloaded at the railway station. We were free, our lives were again our own, even if it was difficult for the time being to grasp the fact. Our priority was to get the artist to hospital, which we did at once. After taking leave of my two companions, I waited for my connection to Salzburg. I watched a train roll out of the station, its passengers crammed aboard like sardines, some standing on the riding boards, others sitting on the carriage roofs. On the roof of the last car, I espied the Viking. He recognised me at once and waved, then in a rare gesture for him raised his right hand to his peaked Jaeger cap with its Edelweiss badge, which to my astonishment he was still wearing, and gave me a final salute. I saluted back instinctively, and then watched the train as it disappeared into the distance behind a cloud of smoke. I never saw the Viking again, but have never forgotten him. I arrived home unannounced on 5 June 1945. My village slept as if knowledge of the great conflagration had escaped its attention. I had survived the inferno practically undamaged physically, although my heart was hard and scarred for life. The spirit of the war has never left me. The records show that I killed 257 Russians under the strict rules of calculating the tally. The actual number was inestimably greater. I was the second highest scoring Wehrmacht sniper after Obergefreiter Matthias Hetzenauer of Brixen near Kitzbühel, also attached to 3rd GD with 345. Was it right? What we did? Under the circumstances, was there some alternative? These are questions to which a private soldier in the Gebergsjäger can probably never find an answer. The simple infantryman never had a choice. It was simply a matter of fight or die. We were soldiers, and we did our duty, and that was all there was to it.